Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy and More with your host John Henry Sheridan. Today I'm excited to have a young artist from Detroit, Misha Monique. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, this is great. So I just see the uh, the show popped up um, on Facebook here. I don't know if you see it yet, but uh, mm -hmm. if you do, go ahead and share it. Yep, I shared it. All right, cool. So if it's on your page too, then your people can see it. So cool. that'll be great. Um, yeah, so it's very casual. So we just do our best, you know. So Misha, um, uh, just for our people's um, uh, information, um, you and I got uh, a chance to meet each other through the CD Baby DIY conference, right? This mm -hmm. past summer, 2021. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, what, what was your uh, feeling about that? How, how was that for you? I thought it was amazing. It was really interesting to network virtually like that um, on that scale because it was quite a few people there. Um, and it was just dope to meet so many people that were just passionate about the music and the music industry and just all the different um, categories of the industry that they were in, you know, all types of professionals, not just, you know, musicians and everything. And yeah, it was just cool to hear people's stories too, all ages, all types of backgrounds. It was a very fun, diverse experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. Was that your first, uh, your first uh, CD Baby conference? That was. That was my first one. And I think right at the end, I got tickets for the one that's coming up. So Sweet. I'll be there. Yes, me too. I got them right away because I was like, yeah. man, that was fun. I wish, I wish it was in person. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. So I'll see you there, I hope. Yes, of course. Yeah. In Austin. That was mm. cool. Uh, right. So so Misha and I, for those who were joining or just watching now, um, yeah, we met at the CD Baby conference because we are both independent artists, music makers, mm -hmm. and uh, we're about to dive into uh, Misha's life a little bit with this interview. I see we got a couple of viewers. So if anyone has a comment or a question as we go along throughout the evening, we'll be talking for a little while, you know, feel free to drop it in. Or if you got to leave and come back, we'll, we'll be hanging out here. So First question for you, Misha. Okay. Can you, am, am I pronouncing your name right, Misha? Is that yeah. how you say it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you remember what it was that got you into enjoying music in the first place? What were some of your earliest memories around that? Yeah, well, I have a few, quite a few um, things that really got me into music from a young age. I would say the biggest thing was when I got to attend church with my grandma as a kid. Um, that was really the only time I got to go to church was when I saw her. So that was pretty much every blue moon. But I just remember as a child, you know, from a very young age, just the feeling that I got inside when the choir would sing and everything, just the type of energy that they had in the church. It like, you know, it, it felt very deep and very genuine. And, you know, it just really interested me in music itself and how it really touches you to your core. Um, I also grew up listening to Alicia Keys. That was my biggest inspiration actually that really, um, so church got me into listening to music and like intrigued by music, but then seeing Alicia Keys got me thinking I could be a part of music. And um, because she's mixed and I was a mixed young girl and she had braids and I had braids too all the time as a kid. Um, I remember her first album with, that I listened to when I was seven was Diary of Alicia Keys. And mm -hmm. um, that's when I started playing piano and my mom heard me playing like piano by ear and stuff. And it just went from there. Oh, wow. So, so there's a couple of cool uh, connections there that I, I could relate to on some level. Um, definitely the church thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder what kind of church it was I imagine it wasn't the Catholic church right no it was um Pentecostal I believe mm -hmm. yeah okay. I'm not like super religious I, I'm I'm thinking it was Pentecostal okay sure. yeah I'm just curious because I, I know I went to some uh different churches I, I was raised born and raised Catholic and then mm -hmm. I went to and I like the music there it's a certain quality to it but yeah. much more somber and like maybe pretty and spiritual mm -hmm. but not bombastic and exciting like some other churches I've been to 
mm-hmm. that have more like a gospel style music. Yeah. So I don't. I was wondering if the church you went to was kind of gospel style. Yeah, it was very gospel. <laughs> okay. Which is which is just in my few experiences with live gospel, it's like might as well be a, a live rock concert. It's like that powerful. It is. Very yeah. Powerful. It's. It was like wow. The few times I was there. Yeah. Uh, so I could see why that would move you uh, to want to get interested in music. Yeah. And then uh, Alicia Keys, um, you know, I'm not particularly a fan of that, you know, the R&B genre mm-hmm. per se, but uh, that her song, No One. Oh, yeah. When that came out, I was teaching at a high school in uh, mm-hmm. East New York. Um, and oh. yeah, and it was uh, it was a rough job, uh, but uh, No One was one of these songs that everyone in the school knew it was like it was really hard to find anything that like a lot of people could relate to for me as a music teacher at that time and no one was something everyone knew it was mm. a kind of an easy piano riff to teach people yeah and I learned the guitar chords and so I learned how to sing it like almost in the right key and everything it was so yeah. ridiculous but <laughs> that's how I would get kids to, to you know sing along right I'll be like the lead singer doing her part but uh yeah that sounds like a good a- song mm-hmm yeah um so was that one of her her earlier albums i don't know her uh no i think it was kind of in the middle like a Mm -hmm. junior maybe yeah Mm -hmm. but um diary of alicia keys was like her second album so i was like a sophomore i believe Mm -hmm. like one like she came out with one more before that um i think songs in a minor was before that but I was only like five so like I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention <laughs> but once Diary of Alicia Keys came out I was like this is it this wow. is it. <laughs> cool yeah I know she's a real artist uh, does she write her own music uh, it seems to me like she yeah. does yeah. yeah she's a producer she's a writer she's a singer she does all of it she's a she does everything she's powerful okay. yeah yeah I, I felt something you know special about her of all mm-hmm. the uh, artists r&b artists that i was aware of and from that kind very of authentic. era yeah she's mm-hmm. a very authentic person yeah i remember she had that song karma was that hers did she write that song i'm not familiar uh, with karma yeah it was kind of a love song but anyway <laughs> um cool great thank you uh so um how would you describe the overall influence music has had in your life in general up up till now um well the overall influence music has I had in my life in general, it's been a very significant part of my entire life. So just like um, music has basically been like my therapy in a way, you know, just to get through emotions, to express myself, to, you know, work through feelings and everything. And for me, like, like I had going back to the Alicia Keys thing, like I started playing piano when I was seven. Um, you know, I, I, started singing before I could talk, before I could even speak words, you know, I was always yeah. singing, um, and just, I would always do a talent show every year, I never missed a talent show since kindergarten through senior year of high school, I did a talent show every year, wow. um, you know, I did band in middle school, I did theater in high school, so anything musical related, you know, I would definitely try to be a part of, um, it just, you know, it, I felt the need to be a part of music and to create music and listen to music, you know, it just feels like such a genuine connection and, you know, puts everything together and in perspective for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I I was listening to a podcast today, this spiritual um, teaching, and this guy was talking about the root of the word magic which is pretty interesting um and he said the original magic was music that was the way to kind of to change the elements and the energy to bring a bunch of people together in a way that just regular language can't do you know pretty interesting uh so uh a friend of mine constantine mediac just posted the link to alicia keys karma so thank you con for pointing out that i'm not oh, crazy <laughs> that it actually exists that's cool yeah and, i haven't uh, listened to a lot of it I haven't listened to a lot of her stuff like as much lately, but yeah, mm. so I gotta listen to that though. See what you're talking about. Yeah, it was pretty, you know, maybe not her best song, but I, I liked it. Um, mm. Yeah, and yeah, anyone uh, who's listening again, feel free to comment. And thanks, Con, for for uh, putting that link up. Yeah, so, 
Um, yeah, so it sounds to me like you're really just like a musical soul from the get-go. Yeah, I was born into it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so your other other family members are musical or besides your grandma? Um actually not a whole lot, really. Um I'm half Persian or Iranian, and mm -hmm. um I do have a cousin that's like a rapper and everything, and you know, Eastern, Middle Eastern music you know, was a big influence in my life too, actually, now that I think about it. Um, my dad always played a lot of Persian songs from back in the day um, when he was mm. growing up. But yeah, no one in my family is really like a huge musician or anything. Definitely full of creatives, mostly like drawers and stuff, just artists, mm -hmm. very visual and everything. Um, but yeah, music has just been kind of like my lane and everything. Mm, interesting. I had a, the good, the fortune, good fortune to play with a uh, saxophone player in one of my, or two of my bands, uh, actually a few, a few different musical formations uh, about 20 years ago anyway. And this guy, um, his name is Amir Miyamoto, and he, he's um, half Japanese, half Iranian. So I learned a lot about Persian music from him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, you know, the Esfahan scale and these certain modes that, you know, mm -hmm. those that music uses. He even got me this like something called a setar, not a sitar, it's an Iranian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he bought me one one time and cool. I learned how to play a little bit. So, so I yeah. know, I know a bit about that. Yeah, that's funny too, because I actually uh, do have some cousins that are Japanese and Iranian as well. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> Small world. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's an interesting combination you know japanese and iranian but uh it yeah. works he could actually pass off for either you know if he told told you he was one you'd be like oh, okay if he told you, right. him, you know, <laughs> it's interesting mm -hmm. um yeah uh so next question i understand that you're influenced by motown soul jazz and funk mm -hmm. uh what is it about those genres of music that inspire you um, well, you know, I really love the warmth that the sounds they bring and just the energy they carry as well. Just it really lifts your mood most of the time. And, um, you know, it's just those sounds are universally loved by anybody that listens to them, you know, and that's really what I try to incorporate into my sound. And that's what really appeals to me in those sounds as well. It's just the very universal feeling that they give and like, just the energy and it's like you know just like a warm hug I don't know they just feel like you know a little dancing around you like little mini kisses and stuff I don't know it just feels mm. good it feels really good and um it feels like it's always been there mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's kind of timeless right mm -hmm. yeah the timelessness of it yeah it's interesting when I I, I wrote a book uh, recently called Music, uh, sorry, Mind Your Music, and it's about paying attention to uh, the vibes of the music we listen to, and that if we're not like consciously listening to basically high vibe music or music that's influencing us, influencing influencing us in a positive way, it will influence us negatively. What you know, if we're not aware of it. And mm -hmm. when I think of the genres of Motown, soul, jazz, and funk, I basically they kind of have like this general positive feeling to them. Not mm -hmm. that all, not that all lyrics are pure or anything like that, you know, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a feel good, certainly Motown. So yeah, they, they, they would put them all in kind of a, I, I, I created this scale of um, healthy music, gray area music and unhealthy music mm -hmm. uh, by way for us to think about it. And, for me, those genres generally fall into um, the light gray kind of mm. towards healthy area, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say all pop in my estimation, and those are all kind of in the touch the pop world, you know, I feel is like, um, is all gray area. Pop is all gray area. There's nothing mm. that's like purely healthy uh, that I've ever encountered really. Maybe there exists, but yeah, uh, it's generally not purely unhealthy either, but oh, there are so certainly dark energy pop that exists you know i see what you mean yeah i was gonna ask like what do you mean like unhealthy and healthy but i get what you mean yeah well you know there's some music uh i won't name any songs or particular artists but you know some mm -hmm. music that makes you feel like 
you know, it's all about money, it's, or it's only about um, sex, or it's degrading maybe yeah. women or people in general, or mm -hmm. super angry, like it wants to destroy people. Right. Yeah, music exists, you know, and, and I've yeah. definitely heard it, and it uh, doesn't lift people up, you know? Yeah, I agree. So I, I, I definitely notice that those genres that you listen to uh, tend to be in that lighter gray yeah. towards healthy. Yeah. my my estimation you know towards it healthy, you yeah. know <laughs> yeah i mean I, I grew up on rock and heavy metal which i readily admit is a lot of it is gray area towards even dark but mm -hmm. um yeah i'm not saying it's right or wrong to listen to yeah dark energy music but it, without a filter without being conscious of it you know it's like eating junk food all the time you know it could, yeah that's uh, a good that's a good effect. analogy i feel yeah that. so um is it uh okay actually so regarding your own music how would you describe it uh, i i called it smooth and soulful when i heard it um you know i don't know it's so hard to define ourselves but how would you define your own music um i really strive towards being as timeless as i can um i'm still figuring out my sound actually but I definitely try to stay around like uh, funk, nostalgic, kind of like wavy a little bit, just real easy listening and like feel good sounds, if that makes sense. So mainly just like, I'll describe it as funk R&B. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, because yeah, you know, you know, being a like a CD baby DIY musician, you have to choose genres right when you're like submitting a song and stuff so mm -hmm. wonder what genres you choose to describe yourself yeah i mainly stick to those just funk and r&b just because r&b is like heavy in my background um but funk just kind of resonates with me a little more and i feel a lot more comfortable in that genre in general just because you know i feel like it comes really easy for me to try to like work with a like funky beat and stuff because it's just easier to like get in the groove of it you know mm -hmm. cool yeah so is there anything you could say in particular about being a musician in Detroit yeah I will say it's hard <laughs> it mm -hmm. is hard um especially being in the genre that I am in um if you consider the R&B side of my genre and everything in the Detroit scene, you know, R&B in general um, is just a difficult genre to break out into, um, especially being in an area like Detroit. There is a lot of talent here, definitely a lot of talent. However, I do feel like there isn't as many creatives in this area as other regions in the U.S. that you probably all know about. <laughs> but, um, you know, so that makes it difficult to kind of like find people that resonate with like my sound and what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of really great talent here that I feel like gets a little bit looked over because it's in Detroit and everything. If it's not hip hop, I don't feel like people really care what comes out of Detroit, unfortunately. Um, which, you know, we brought Motown and I'm sure we can bring another Motown of our own version um, in this modern day again, you mm -hmm. know, but it's just, we're not quite there yet. And um, yeah, just breaking out in Detroit is, it's, it's a difficult experience, especially being in R&B and funk. I don't really see a whole lot of funk in Detroit in general. Um, if anybody out there is listening to this and is in the funk and is in the Detroit area, hit me up. But um, yeah, otherwise, it's, it's dope talent out here, but it's very looked over and a little limited. Mm -hmm. Is Detroit, I mean, I, I know it's, it, to my, I never been there, so I know to my ears, my, I imagine it's kind of a big, fairly big metropolitan area or, or not so big. Oh yeah, our metropolitan is huge. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I don't know. I just off the top of my head, I'd say probably at least like maybe 30 million, and that's probably an underestimate. You know, so it's a lot of it's a big metro area compared to like the individual city of Detroit and stuff. So okay. it's a lot. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, 
yeah I, when i the only detroit music i know so is it right that motown came out of detroit I, mm -hmm. yeah okay that makes sense to me i didn't officially know that but i kind of mm -hmm. sensed it yeah. um and uh the only detroit band i could think of is uh, mc5 i imagine you may not know them they were hard rock band like 60s i've heard of them yeah yeah i know um i what's his name i think jack white is from oh, Detroit okay. as well the detroit area oh, okay. like there's yeah. been some big artists like Aaliyah. um of course everybody knows Aaliyah, and mm -hmm. um who else like we got third man records out here which is a branch from jack white as his brand um yeah there's been aretha franklin of course okay you know, mm -hmm. um and well you know all the people from motown smoky michael diana all of them mm -hmm. Oh wow! Okay, so it's been been a, a lot of decent artists out here. I think the temp the Temptations might not be from here. I know Stevie Wonder is from Saginaw, so he's from out here too. Oh yeah, not far. That, I mean, that's not like really the metro area, but he got brought to Motown and he was from Michigan. Oh, okay, and a friend of mine, uh, Khan, chimed in saying uh, James Jamerson, the band leader of the Motown House band. Mm. I guess he's another uh, Detroit guy. That's a cool um, Yeah, Detroit. Hmm. Is it uh, the image we have, non-Detroit Americans, uh, is this like the car industry going under and then like this like really difficult, I don't know, economic situation? Is that still going on or did you not really see so much of that? Um. Yeah, there's definitely still some economic things going on i do want to throw back to um big sean too real quick i cannot forget him <laughs> oh okay. yeah he's trouble no i'm kidding but um yeah the, the economy is um it's okay i guess it's not the best you know but everybody's kind of struggling out here regardless um but i say the cost of living is decent you know for what the wages are considered um but just overall it is a struggle for a lot of people out here especially like post you know what happened mm -hmm. and everything a lot of people have been struggling um I know the housing prices have been ridiculous out here incredibly ridiculous um mm -hmm. highly highly competitive and high and um yeah I mean I haven't heard anything too too bad about the economy right now that's been like news breaking and everything but you know it's still a struggle with like all the shortages and us being like an industrial based city mm -hmm. you know so when there's supply shortages and we have a lot of like factories that depend on these external supplies to operate and stuff a lot of people have been you know losing their jobs or getting let go or being laid off because of what's been going on hmm. all right yeah well thanks for uh an inside perspective on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Detroit. Hmm. Uh, so Khan says that uh, actually James Jameson was born in South Carolina, but uh, anyway, he, he looked it up, but <laughs> I guess he's affiliated with Detroit somehow. Mm. Um, have you ever been to Brooklyn out of, out of curiosity or New York City? I have been to New York City, mm -hmm. Manhattan, but I have not been to Brooklyn. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, Brooklyn's pretty famous uh, around the world for whatever reason. It seems anywhere I go, someone has yeah. some sort of connection to Brooklyn somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and we and I say Brooklyn because we don't really identify ourselves as New Yorkers. Um, mm -hmm. We're Brooklynites, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, nothing wrong with being a New Yorker. I am a New Yorker, of course, but uh, I'm a Brooklynite first, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so do you feel that creative expression is a key component to maintaining and perhaps acquiring a healthy mind body and spirit um yeah i feel like creative expression is definitely a part of our spirit um and how we express ourselves for me you know i'm a creative through and through and you know if i I, I don't feel like I should keep a lot of stuff inside that, you know, my mind creates. And, you know, I feel like that's kind of unhealthy spiritually, you know, because um, I do feel like 
we are creations created by the creator and you know people say we're created in their image and I feel like my interpretation of us being created in their image is that we're creators ourselves as well and that's why we create and um so I feel like you know it's like a full circle kind of moment in um you know creativity and spirituality being you know kind of intertwined together Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um yeah for me I you know to use kind of a vulgar analogy um if I don't put out the creative stuff in me I do feel constipated you know like just I I do it because it's you know it's healthy for me Mm -hmm. of course there's the element of I want to be recognized I want to be seen and heard but if I didn't do it it wouldn't be good for me so like like first and foremost I'm a creative and just like a you know an ant goes and finds food and and brings the food back or or a bee searches for pollen or nectar or whatever I'm Mm -hmm. that's for me I'm just a guy that creates a lot of stuff and I can't help it and and that makes my life rich and it sounds like you're similar you just you're a creative person you can't help it that's how you function yeah yeah i wonder how people who are not like creatively inclined because we all have creativity within us of course Mm -hmm. like i wonder how they you know the 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 non-creatives you know view the importance of creativity that's really hard to like imagine i feel like (laughs) it's got to be there in some way shape or form you know like even doctors in how they treat patients like surgeons and stuff i feel like that's a form of creativity in a way you know, sure. with how they go about performing the surgery and, you know, patching things up and everything. I feel like that's a form of creativity, if that makes sense. Maybe. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, any housewife or house husband, you know, cooking a dinner for their family, they do it this way, they do it that way. They, you know, they put the, this spice on or they don't, you know, it's all creative. You know, you can make breakfast a different way every day or you can make it exactly the same. It's, you know, I, yeah. we could be creative at any turn, really. Yeah. yeah, I feel like it'll be kind of like madness just to have no creativity in like any way, shape, or form. It's yeah. kind of crazy. Getting to feel like a robot or something. Yeah, gotta be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so I've checked out your Spotify page um, and I enjoy listening to, I'll just Thank let you. it play, you know, and listen to the soulful, smooth tunes. Um, how has your and I recommend anyone listening to this please go check our Spotify page and uh, YouTube page do you have a YouTube page I imagine I do have a YouTube yeah yeah I thought I think I've seen it and and I'll put the links in the show notes so people can find that yeah um, yes please go listen to it guys and gals um, how has your journey been in finding your voice as an artist because from what I hear mm-hmm. you kind of have a you know you have a, a style um I don't know how many years you've been at it, but you, you sound mm-hmm. like you've settled into a, a style that's definitely your, sounds like you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I really started professionally recording when I was like 13. Wow. And um, yeah, but I actually ended up giving up on music after I turned 16 um, for realistic things in life. Mm -hmm. and um post-college that's when I got back into music seriously I never really gave up 100% I just kept it like as a hobby you know just singing here and there when I get the chance you know playing with the piano here and there um but post-college is when I really started taking music seriously again um so that's been just in the process of finding my sound I listen and imitate as many things that I enjoy when I listen to music um so my favorite singers at the moment you know I have a huge obsession with Frank Ocean and just mainly his most his last album Blonde in the production of it um so that's kind of like how I kind of interpret like try to pull that into my own sound in a way Um, I also enjoy like the weekend and stuff too. Um, But just in general, you know, practicing as much as I can um, and imitating, you know, all all of music is just 12 notes, you know, Mm -hmm. so it kind of can get a little um, repetitive after a while. And it's really all music is, it's just copying off of, 
you know, what other people have done in the past and just throwing your own little twist on it. Um, so that's what I really try to do to find my sound. Um, I do, I, I experiment a lot and I analyze a lot, you know, so when I make a song, I'm like, I really like where this is going. I want to try and make something else like this, maybe a similar vibe, but better and everything. And um, yeah, just experiment and analyze a whole lot and practice is what I try to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because your, your music sounds like really real music. It sounds mm -hmm. like a, like thoughtful, composed, like there's actually, are there actually musicians playing? Um, no, not too much? No, I actually got most of the songs that I posted off of Beat Stars from mm -hmm. like just listening to beats and stuff on Beat Stars because it's really difficult for me to find like um, producers and produce myself as well. Um, I don't feel like I'm at a level where I can produce my own full on music yet. Um, so I mainly use Beat Stars and um, a local producer by the name of Slate as well and another producer named Jupiter um, for creating a lot of the beats that I do. Um, I do mm -hmm. write my songs though. The last couple that I wrote, I did have a co-writer that wrote them with me as well um, by the name of Ramon and everything. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. It's it's cool. It, like I said, it's it, when I listen to it, it sounds like, uh, yeah, like that timeless universal singer singer songwriter in the vein of you know Motown uh, yeah. soul music. Yeah, it's 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 very rich, and whatever the mood you're creating, this kind of romantic mood, it yeah. comes across. You know, I definitely feel that. Yeah, I really enjoy bringing a lot, a lot of warmth into my music. You know. Just kind of give everybody a little warm hug. <laughs> yeah. Not to I sound bet. cheesy, but yeah. Everyone needs it. So <laughs> nothing do. cheesy about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so can you tell us one of the greatest lessons you've had uh, along your journey that helps you remain positive, upbeat, moving forward? Because we all know that life can throw us uh, some punches and knock us down. So what makes you you know you have a positive vibe and a good attitude you know what, yeah what's the driving force of that I would say the biggest lesson for me I think I would say that life I tell myself life is a marathon and not a race and that you can be whoever you work towards becoming so that's, that's how I feel about just, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> no, that, that's the answer. answer it? Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, well, you could be who you work towards becoming, right? That's yeah, whoever you, you work towards becoming. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I mean, it takes work for sure. Nothing is going to happen like overnight at all. And that was a major like hump in the road that I had to get over because like I want everything right now, right now. You know, that's what really discouraged me was when I would work, like, I feel like I would work really hard, you know, maybe for like a month or so, you know, I'll be singing like every day I'm doing good and then go and present my skills and experience rejection or not the results that I wanted, but you can't expect long-term results from short-term actions. And so that's what I had to like get into my head is like, it's a marathon. It's not a race. I'm working towards like, I, and like dealing with the doubt too. I had a lot of imposter syndrome. I do still deal with imposter syndrome of saying like, who am I to think that I can be that, you know, but it's really like, why can't I be that? There's nothing mm -hmm. really stopping you besides yourself. Cause you know, a lot of people have a lot of opinions and everything, but you're still you and you have your own mind and your own story for how you want yourself to be. And like, if this is what I really want, I have to do or follow the steps needed to achieve that. And that's not going to happen in a year. It might not happen in two years, but as long as I keep working towards it, it, I say it's going to happen and it can happen to me. It can happen to you. It can happen to anybody. You know, nobody is um, I mean, there are people who have situations that allow them to achieve those things a little easier, 
but it doesn't mean you can't achieve it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. what, that's what I try to tell myself, you know, like I'm not nobody. It can happen. You know, you just got to keep working and keep working and keep working and, you know, manifest it. Yeah. It sounds to me like the, by the answer to the greatest lesson question is kind of your mantra of, if you call it that, of this, uh, idea that it's it's a marathon not a race um and because you know you get those up and down sometimes you feel like you're doing great then you're rejected or you just things don't go the way you're planning or hoped um yeah for me the way i would kind of phrase my similar experience and my similar attitude is um i'm a lifer that's how i put it you know it's like i'm not going anywhere like i said i can't help right music i can't yeah. create so uh if it's gonna look a certain way like you know a certain status or not for me i don't really care at this point I, you know i imagine i'm a little older i've had a little more of a journey but mm -hmm. um you know i feel like i uh, uh i'm a lifer so i'm just going to put out as much content musical video uh interviews you know uh, books as I can poetry I do poetry uh, mm. before I die because yeah. I want there to be something some sort of legacy that I left behind of my creativity yeah and you know I, I have a son for him but, but really for any, anybody any human being that comes across it um, and yeah and that it is a marathon and it's a, just to tweak the marathon thing you can actually do a marathon and walk you don't have to jog you know i mean that is yeah. technically possible you know yeah but you're gonna finish you're gonna cross the finish line eventually yeah that's the know? thing yeah you go at your own pace mm -hmm. yeah like if you know the tortoise and the hare story oh yeah exactly yeah yeah I, I call myself the tortoise that that's what i uh because <laughs> i'm gonna go at my own pace but i'm gonna go and if anyone else thinks they're gonna beat me they might mm -hmm. but they might be surprised you know what I, i'm not competing with anybody but you, you know what i mean like this uh this idea that going faster going harder is better i don't subscribe mm -hmm. to that personally yeah i feel it um so let's see what next question do i have for you uh it's kind of the same so if you feel like you, you've already been there done that we'll move on but what aspect of your life philosophy helps you to recover from setbacks if there's anything to add um, to what you said. Yeah, I'll add a little bit to that. Um, I would say, <clears throat> I feel like life is always like an ebb and flow, kind of like what we were kind of talking about, you know, it's full of ups and downs, it comes and goes, you know, and there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad, but then I try not, like that was another negative thing that was in my head too, was thinking of everything as good and bad you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, nothing is really good and bad. It's just life. You know, that's just what life is full of. And that's like, what creates our story and everything and our experiences, you know, that's what um, really makes us who we are and creates our journey. And, you know, brings us to what we become and everything. And you just take whatever life throws at you and you just got to keep pushing and take the lessons you learn from those situations. Mm -hmm. Right. And nothing is truly either good or bad. In essence, it's all like our thoughts that, that make it so, right? Yeah, it just is. Yeah, it, it all just is. It's, it's neither good nor bad. Um, I, I agree with that for sure. And uh, I, I practiced Buddhism since 2009, mm -hmm. uh, officially as a member you know but mm. i had the buddhist soul for a long time and uh yeah you know and and even now my philosophy not necessarily directly related to buddhism but uh yeah. is this concept of non-duality you know that there is no real uh, other there's there's no like right wrong good bad it's all this one incredible if you want to use the term creator Mm -hmm. uh, some people use the term God, or I, I like to use the term universe. That just feels better for me. But, you know, uni verse meaning one. Yeah. I like to think of a uni verse 
uni meaning one verse meaning song so it's like one song we're all creating together like one yeah. great piece that we're all one itty bitty tiny instrument in this massive symphony you know yeah. you know that's actually pretty interesting because um you know even though I said like you know I went to my grandma's church on occasion on the very rare occasion mm -hmm. um I did mainly grow up Baha'i I'm not sure if you know what that religion is um, but yeah, it originated in Iran. Um, so me being half Iranian, my father carried it over into our family that he created. Mm -hmm. And um, the Baha'i faith actually has similar values in thinking of um, or believing in like the oneness of humanity, the oneness of religion, and there being one God for all religions. There's actually um, one of the beliefs is also the... Um, Oh, shoot. What's the word? Profit. Um, it's just basic. I can't remember the word. Pro progressive revelations. It's called progressive revelations. And that's basically like all the profits that we have had throughout our existence as human beings on this earth, you know, so like Zoroaster, Abraham, Jesus, Moses, um, you know, we call Abdul Baha like the, the prophet for our religion is just called progressive revelations because it's like they believe that God what they call God sends a prophet every thousand or so years to help society progress from where they're currently at mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah and, um, sure I'm like, that's very cool. And then, so that's why I believe that there's only one God because it's one God for all religions in a mm -hmm. way that we're all, you know, just one humanity and it's all about unity and stuff. But yeah, that just reminded me of that too. Just like the oneness of the universe and, you know, everything. Yeah, that's cool. I, didn't, I never heard of that particular religion. How, how do you spell it? Baha? B-A-H-A-I, Baha'i. Baha'i, oh, cool. Yeah, learn something new all the time. That, that's one of the great things about um, doing an interview series like this, uh, just dialogue in general. You know, there's mm -hmm. always something to learn uh, from one another. You know, we yeah. can only learn so much by ourselves. And you could read and look as many YouTube videos as you want, but something about one to one human interaction, we kind of absorb things differently, you know? Yeah, definitely. and we could share ourselves too. We could share our own life journey. Um, yeah, in in Buddhism, I practice uh, Nichiren Buddhism with the SGI, mm -hmm. and I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. If mm -hmm. you ever saw the Tina Turner movie, you hear her chanting it. It's she practices too, apparently. Mm -hmm. I haven't but, seen it in a while, but I'll, oh, yeah. I'll watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I mean, she's pretty cool as far as I as far as I know. But um, uh, so one of the concepts in, in Nichiren Buddhism is uh, the importance of dialogue, you know, and that the world, you know, if it's all about world peace, really, and being happy, and, yeah. and our own happiness is equally as important as anyone else's happiness. So while this Bodhisattva spirit, in the, you know, like you picture of Gandhi or Mother Teresa or, or Nelson Mandela, people who like really lived for others. Yeah. That that spirit is only true if you're living for yourself too. If mm. you're just throwing your life away for the sake of others, that doesn't that's not really a, a good model for people to follow. You know, yeah. people have to believe that they could be happy. And so our own happiness, others' happiness, both super important, you know, that mm. everyone's happy to we're all happy together. It doesn't mean like we're all smiling at the same time, but we're all can be joyful uh simultaneously so and within that the concept is that life um peace can only really happen on this planet through one-to-one -one dialogue it's really mm -hmm. grassroots stuff of course or small groups you know right but like you know like talking to hundreds and thousands of people or mm -hmm. that's not going to change people's hearts but one-to-one -one dialogue with people listening respecting sharing empowering you know that could actually make a difference that's the kind of the concept yeah yeah 100 percent um so has your tastes and and perspectives relating to music shifted and evolved over the years 
I mean, from us in some degree, but I wonder how it has. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, just from being a child and listening to, you know, childish music, like, you know, listening to Disney all the time as a kid and then, you know, listening to a lot of mainstream pop. 955 out here was a popular station for like mainstream music. So that was a lot of what I listened to um, in middle school and into high school. You know, I didn't start, like I found some artists that were like not like commonly listened to a little bit on occasion as a kid, like through YouTube or like LimeWire at the time, that's a throwback. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, yeah, over the years, I definitely just feel like I've just spiraled into a little bit of everything, you know, cause um, I like to try and pull as much as I can from everything cause you just never know what could inspire you. And so I just feel like over the years, um, especially now, like when I listen to music, I try to like look for stuff that I haven't listened to. Um, I know my comfort playlist is Pollen, the Pollen playlist on Spotify, where they have a lot of like indie and like genreless music, um, kind of like avant-garde styles. But overall, you know, I try to explore a lot. Um, I've gotten more into folk. Like I used to hate country. I hated country so much as a kid. Like I would literally cry as a child when my mom would play country. Um, but <laughs> now I'm way better. I enjoy folk music. I listen to the Abbott Brothers all the time, Silver Synthetic, um, you know, all those artists. And just I, I now when I listen to music, I try to be more analytical when I listen to them. So I listen to them with intention. Um, as far as like the production, the lyrics, you know, the vocals, how they, you know, like how they emphasize their voice for certain parts, how the song comes together, how there might be like drums pulled out at a certain section or building up. And like, I listen to that for my own music to be like, I like how this song made me feel like I felt cool for a second and now I'm like feeling tense and stuff and I learned um that word is called frisson and stuff when they do that in music and that's mm-hmm. like you know where you create like this dissonance or like disconnection or like not just those things but just like a really uncomfortable sound that makes you feel like you know your chest feels tight even though it's like just a song but you right. feel it in your mm-hmm. body like your ears are hearing it. it's like this is something's wrong and then all of a sudden like it releases like the a day in the life by the Beatles is a great mm-hmm. example of that you know like the way that the band kind of like chaotically crescendos and stuff and then they immediately pull back and it goes into like this happy piano like you know it's crazy mm-hmm. how <laughs> you feel doing that and, like that's something I have the biggest goal of trying to achieve is like creating frisson like that song um, the song Nights by Frank Ocean and A Day in the Life by the Beatles, they both have like that element of frisson that I really want to put into my music. Um, but yeah, just I try to be as diverse as possible and just constantly explore. Like I'll even listen to like, you know, foreign music, like me being half Persian. I listen to like Persian music and listen to how they do their, um, you know, they have a different um scale that we use on the western side and they have different like um uses of how they go about the scales and everything you know so like you know it might be a normal for us to do a simple like um what's the word one one five three three five one four five one four five one i think it is you know and they'll they'll do like a different type of um chord progressions you Mm -hmm. know they'll do a completely yeah. different chord progression. And so I'm like, that's interesting. It it sounds wrong in our Western side, but it's right in the Eastern side. <laughs> and it's just crazy how music is like differently interpreted. So, you know, I just try to, I'm very analytical now and just very observant and, you know, <laughs> it's exploring all the time. Yeah, wow, that sounds, sounds fun. Um, I haven't had that curiosity towards music in a while uh so it's it's exciting to see someone like yourself with that still like really just like a sponge taking it all in to create your own unique (laughs) blend right of all these uh, influences yeah um yeah world music 
so so cool when i got into world music you know i, I started to say oh but yeah I, for me it you know certain things felt wrong at first yeah. I'm like oh, i don't know about that that's mm -hmm. weird and then i'm like actually you know what just Amer american and british music which is predominantly what i listen to mm. is uh it's kind of bland sometimes so these other flavors is uh <laughs> it's nice you know it makes life interesting <laughs> <laughs> It is <laughs> really you know yeah uh, i went to india um i was fortunate to go to india in 2009 and it was just i met i, I actually composed some music there for some okay. college films cool and uh that was fun so i got you know to use those scales and i probably used actually persian scales because that's the one i was most familiar with mm -hmm. and uh to get that because you know persian and indian music can definitely yeah sound very similar, similar. Mm -hmm. um and uh so i remember this one guy on on like, this camera crew uh said yeah I, he said i stayed in uh london for a couple of months or something and uh i brought i had to bring my own spices whenever i went out to eat because just everything tasted like nothing to me mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said like eventually i had to leave the food was so bad <laughs> that's basically what he said i was like wow. oh man you know but but <laughs> And 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 my you know you know I'm not from England but I did go there I uh, I know what he means and then when I went to India you know in India there's no such thing as uh, as no spice if you say no spice they don't know what you're talking about you could say less spice but yeah. the, no spice doesn't work <laughs> no <laughs> you know nice. and and their music has flavors that I really enjoy and, and that are very like I remember when I first time I had Indian food. Actually, I was in London, funny enough, and mm. uh, at an Indian restaurant there, someone took us out to eat. Uh, I was on a study abroad, and I remember experiencing flavors that I had no words for. It's mm. like, I'm like, I, I, sweet, sour, I can't use those words. This is, I never experienced anything like that. It was very exciting. I couldn't, you know, if I liked it or not, you know? Yeah. But later, I realized basically I do, but mm. uh yeah, so the same thing would happen when I would listen to new styles of music. There'd be these kind of flavors that, you know, I never really heard before, but yeah, you know, uh, and then I would incorporate them here and there, you know, in, in my in my own music. Um, but just uh, just to enjoy life more, it's fun to really yeah, take it all in. it's always fun just to like break out and try something different you know get out of your comfort zone your usual you know see what else um, is out there yeah so your taste and perspective just keep on keep on changing and keep on evolving right yep, always evolving <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of uh frisian which i never heard that word before um yeah the, the way i would think of it my terms would be uh tension and release yeah you know? it is pretty much you know this like kind of building up of uh, or, or contrast right contrast mm -hmm. is another way of putting it i, yeah, I studied like a stark uh, contrast right yeah like a stark kind yeah um yeah i studied composition in uh, brooklyn college music composition when mm -hmm. i was you know undergrad and so i definitely saw uh like you're saying sometimes music can really make you feel uncomfortable so, you know like horror movie music is great for that mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I saw how classical composers, particularly 20th century composers, mm. were using these like really dis disharmonic, uh, un a uh, sometimes uh, often atonal. Atonal music mm. can be very jarring, which mm -hmm. is a 20th century thing. And yeah. uh, and then if 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 well done, it could like they could just take this super tense thing and, and ease it into a more harm harmonic pattern that just makes you feel great because of how bad you just felt but yeah. if you just did that kind of positive pretty sounding stuff you would kind of take it for granted maybe you know yeah. because it was that placement prop that you know strategic placement mm -hmm. absolutely uh, you know of attention before it yeah i wonder if i could think of any good example of that um, um maybe moonlight sonata yeah, I guess that, that definitely has some moments where it's like about to. Uh, it's pretty dark, though, for the most part. 
Yeah, pre yeah. Uh, it doesn't get too uncomfortable and doesn't get too kind of beautiful uh, unless that's well, it is quite beautiful, but um actually there's one piece I could think of. Uh Samuel Barber mm. Adagio for strings. If you could get a chance to listen to that. I think I used to cry when I listened to it. I really do. Um oh, wow. I think he composed that in the 50s or maybe 40s, something like that. 1950s mm. or 40s. Adagio for strings. Like it's just like building, 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 and uh it's slow, very slow. And then it kind of climaxes at that golden ratio, kind of like mm. three quarters of the way in type of thing. Mm. And uh yeah, it it's something special and then if you want to hear like real awful sounding stuff but with an intention with a good purpose yeah. there's something called threnody threnody, threnody f uh, t h r e n o d y it's called threnody for the victims of hiroshima mm. and it was a piece uh 20th century classical composition of like 50 strings or something, a huge orchestra of strings mm -hmm. that was designed to make you feel the horror of the nuclear bomb dropping. Mm. So when you listen to it, you feel like your face is being ripped off. It's it's mm. it's not like anyone's screaming, it's all strings. Yeah. But it, it's so oh. it's so awful. And uh, but it's it's cathartic in a way. It's like, mm. thank you for recognizing this, you know, thank you mm -hmm. to the composer and the artists who recorded it for like just facing it mm -hmm. you know the horror of it in a, in a artistic way right right yeah I don't think it really resolves I don't remember maybe there was like there must be kind of like some sort of resolution point mm -hmm. I remember it was hard to listen to but it was mo moving in in that you know powerful way yeah I listened to that for sure yeah, Adagio for strings, Serenity. And, and one other thing, classical wise, that comes to mind in terms of like contrast mm -hmm. is Mars, the bringer of war. Like if I you haven't, haven't heard that, that is super, that's like heavy metal before heavy metal was even thought of, dreamt up mm -hmm. of. So okay. this guy, Gustav Holst, I think he was like in a hospital bed when he wrote The Planets. He wrote this like, I think he only did seven of them. Uh, maybe Pluto wasn't discovered yet, mm -hmm. uh, but he wrote a, the, a piece for um, Mercury, Venus, all the way through to Neptune mm. or Uranus, uh, seven or eight. I don't think he did nine. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, Jupiter is really fun, jovial, and really, really moving. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them use like really kind of odd uh, modes. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, Mars, the bringer of war, mm -hmm. it's got this theme that actually, it sounds very much, it sounds like Star Wars. So you have to believe that the guy, John John Williams, yeah. based the large amount of the Star Wars theme on Mars, the bringer of war, which was written like 30, 40 years before Star Wars. Wow, that's interesting. And and the the main thing that it, it builds and builds when it, it takes a long time to get to the like the climax point mm -hmm. it, i don't know it might be like six minutes in that it gets to like the part you're waiting for six minutes it, it, it's a while but you'll yeah. know it's the part and it's good if you put it loud and then the main thing comes in in five four so it's not like anything you could like play you know play a a, a backbeat to it goes dun 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 like with these big deep sounding uh, horns or whatever with this yeah. like overlay of this you know uh kind of evil sounding melody yeah it's it, like you feel like oh here's the war you know it's <laughs> it's powerful wow yeah that sounds very powerful i definitely gotta check that out yeah i am you, your uh, frisian talk kind of triggered something <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, that's definitely more more diversity to add to my collection for sure cool yeah 
And I'll listen to Frank Ocean. I don't think I know. Oh my this. gosh. Yes. So. Listen to the Blonde album. My favorite song is like either it's between Nights and Siegfried. So okay. Nights, like like Nighttime Nights. Mm-hmm. And it's Siegfried is S E I G F R E I D. Yeah, I think that's how you spell it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so let's see. Uh, I think, yeah, maybe we didn't quite get to this, but uh, do you have a spiritual philosophy that guides and informs what you do and how you live? Um, I do believe in destiny, if that makes sense, in, in my spiritual philosophy. Um, you know, like I have a little tattoo on my arm of a Persian calligraphy called Kesmet, and it's basically like, God's plan is already written in a way. So like whatever happens in life was meant to happen, you know, and you just take that. I think like I said previously, you know, just take life's lemons as a lesson and create lemonade out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just whatever happens was meant to happen. You know, this is your story and no one else's. So it's just your destiny and you take it for what it is. And make the best out of it Mm -hmm. nice so oh so that's so kismet i've heard kismet comes to my mind but i don't know yeah it's it's basically kismet but it's just pronounced kismet in okay uh so that's where it comes from it's a persian thing or um i don't know if it originates from iran but you know they're very all those countries are very similar and you know they eventually were one you know way 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 back in ancient times um Mm -hmm. so you know i feel like it's the same thing pretty much it's kismet like just destiny okay so when you say destiny you kind of mean or you do mean um that uh you were meant to we or you or anybody is meant to follow a certain path in life yeah exactly yeah so like everything i've been through you know all the failures i've had giving up on music and then getting back right into music and everything was supposed to be because, you know, I had, um, when I gave up to go pursue realistic, you know, goals, I went to college, (laughs) I went to school for business at the Eli Broad College of Business at Michigan State. And, you know, I thought that was what my life would become. I went to school for marketing and, um, you know, I graduated with my marketing degree, but I didn't get a job right away, you know, and I'm like, I did five years because I did community college too first, but I'm like, I did five years of this and like, I didn't really care about it that much, you know, but going into music again and like, it gave me the drive of like kind of feeling desperate almost like I have to get back into music. Like this is what always felt right to me you know, and I spent all these years getting this degree that I don't really care for, you know, so I'm like, I got to catch up on lost time, but it's not even really lost time because me being a musician now and with where I'm at, what I learned about marketing is what I can apply to myself as an artist now. Yeah, I have the business knowledge going to a world-renowned business college that I'm not saying like, or discounting any artist or anything, but I'm saying a lot of artists' downfalls is they don't understand business, the business side of music or business in general, seeing themselves as a business. And so I feel like, you know, that's the benefit of me going down a path I went to was like, it was for a reason. You know, I experienced people and situations and the education I gained and it's not a loss. You know, I still Mm -hmm. gained something out of it and I can still apply it to my current situation. And I feel like it actually helps my situation a little more like, I did lose a lot of time and lost focus on music and stuff. So like, maybe I could have gone ahead and did it and be somewhere, but like, you know, that time's gone and that's the path I chose. And so I have to take what I chose and create what I can for what I've done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm sure the the business school thing must've been tough in the sense that's not where your soul was. Not at all. That's what, you, that's what you felt was kind of important to do for whatever external you know pressures you know exist for us but uh 
also I can imagine another side benefit to what you said of definitely bringing the business knowledge into your music ability is so helpful, I imagine, mm -hmm. and key. Uh, but another thing was probably that you may not perceive is that uh, depriving yourself of, in, of focusing on music for so long probably really increased your hunger and thirst for it. You know? It did, yeah, and, absolutely. And that's really a benefit I, from what I could see because uh, mm -hmm. you could have gone down the path of music, not get the business knowledge, and then get jaded because it wasn't working out, you know, right. or getting stuck in a part of the music business that you don't really like, like being a wedding singer or something, not that there's anything wrong with that, but maybe yeah, since you're so creative, that might not be for you, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I see what you're saying about the, the kit, kit Kazmat or um, yeah, the destiny, how the divine plan perhaps yeah. is another way to say it. Yeah, it's already written. Yeah, I have a similar feeling in my own journey, uh, which is that, well, I, I want to be a rock star and I got close, I tasted it, you know, I signed up some autographs, I recorded in a multi-million dollar studio and went on a small tour and, uh, you know, played so many shows with so many different people, wrote a lot of music, but never made a whole, never made more than a little bit of money at it really. Mm -hmm. So it never paid my bills. Uh, guitar teaching did for years. So it was music related. But um, yeah, then, then I kind of got out of it. And uh, then it was teacher, focusing on teaching. Then I became a humanitarian volunteer. And I quit everything, quit school, quit my job, moved out of my apartment, and just kind of took a deep dive. And then that's through that I met my wife. And then I lived, lived in Brazil for half a year. Then I lived in Japan and I refocused my, you know, my music, uh, whatever ability I had to concentrate to learn music deeply, I took it off of music and put it onto language. And I learned how to speak Portuguese and I learned how to speak Japanese uh, about a year later and uh, pretty well. So I, I can get by and uh, um then, you know, I was kind of really redefining myself. And then I became, a, uh, when I moved, I was in Japan for a while, I moved back. Mm -hmm. uh, I now I'm practicing Buddhism and I'm here and in the U.S. and finding it, you know, not wanting to become a rock rocker anymore, but still kind of stuck with the guitar music. And then I became a Buddhist leader. I was requested mm -hmm. to do it, take on leadership role. And I did that for about seven years and it's very intense, you know, cause I'm thinking about others as well as myself, plus my family. And, uh, and then I became diabetic along that. So that was another, but anyway, I, I, sometimes I look back on my life and I do feel a little bit of PTSD. Like sometimes there were difficult things that I don't really want to think about. Yeah. But uh, where I am now, it's like, I do feel the divine plan you know, that like, this is where I'm meant to be. I, I could have this, you know, I could do these, this interview series. I can create music at home. Uh, I can write my books. I, I wrote a few, I, I wrote one. I, I did a few guitar books as well. I'm mm -hmm. working on my autobiography right now, um, gardening. And uh, who knew that this is what I would like to do? This kind okay. of simple, um domestic life but but i i feel like now i'm at a point where i could really use all my talents and skills and all the things that didn't work out actually uh gave me lessons in either learning a new skill like let's say i could speak japanese or portuguese or made me realize that uh i really don't like don't want to do that other thing so now when i go back to just gardening i realize gardening is great you know or you know what I mean? Like by yeah. sort of failing at what I think I should do. Yeah. And I could realize that what I could have done all along is what I want to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but mm -hmm. without trying and failing something else, I might not be so confident in the thing that I like now. Mm -hmm. type of, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> quite a journey. How, how it, it just is not a question I, uh, I have prepared, but how did the past two years affect you um you know the COVID thing in terms of your creativity or just your your overall 
health in terms, you know, spirit? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I feel like I actually grew a lot, um, despite a lot of horrible, horrible things going on around the world and in our country and everything. Um, I was blessed enough to not really go through a whole lot relating to COVID. Um, I did get the vaccine. I, I fought it. I was one of the people that tried to fight it, but you know, I forgot. It was something I had to get it. Oh, I was going to New York. So I had to get it. So yeah, that was that was amazing to going to New York. Beautiful, beautiful place. Um, but um, yeah, no, I actually um, I had a lot of positive experiences. That was when I created a lot of my music that I love the most by myself. Um, I had lost actually a lot of weight. I started working out outside a lot. Like I was going to the gym before COVID and didn't lose a pound. But then when the gyms closed down and COVID started, I, I got outside. Like I just started losing weight because I was just like, I couldn't stay in the house. I had to be active. And um, that's what really got me to, you know, become healthier and everything. It made me more health conscious too with COVID in general, you mm -hmm. know, just making sure I keep up with like, my cardio, what I eat. Um, and then just like, you know, seeing how quick life can change also gave me the boost that I was already writing off of post-college because I graduated in 19. Thank goodness, you know, right mm -hmm. before everything started. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, so I came out in 19 and was like, I'm gonna start go doing music again. And I experienced the rejection because like I had just got back into it. And then COVID hit and I'm like, dang, like, this is going to really mess me up some more. And I, I barely started, but, you know, I just kept grinding anyway. I took that isolation to learn, you know, like when I was working, I was constantly listening to like all the music of different varieties, listening to like an analysis podcast about my favorite songs, you know, to really dig deep into how they were created and, you know, just trying to take every spare moment I had to further develop myself as an artist. So yeah, I took a lot of that to grow like spiritually, personally, and professionally, you know, just in every opportunity I could take. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's inspiring. It seems like it, I would guess, because because you the you know the vibe you have now, I would imagine yeah. <laughs> you were kind of, you know, thriving to some degree throughout mm -hmm. that because because you've been producing some great music. So mm -hmm um you know just well, yeah I, I think covid in general that or, or for lack of a better term to kind of like sum up that past two years or so uh i think it gave people a lot of people an opportunity to go in inward you mm -hmm. know because you couldn't go out for a while anyway not easily and no. you know so then you could think about well what really is important to me and yeah what if i do die tomorrow you know like, exactly it felt like that, the world <laughs> like, yeah. everything was running out everybody was losing their jobs everything was shut down we couldn't do anything and i was like i'm gonna just do me for now because i can't do anything else right yeah and of course the reality is uh we could die at any time anyway it doesn't have to be covid doesn't have to be like when we travel abroad you know like uh tomorrow i'm taking a drive out to Long Island for the dentist mm -hmm. with my wife and my leaving my son with my mom and he's like he said something like you know dad if you guys die tomorrow I think I'm gonna kill myself oh. but he's six and I, I know his feeling you know I told him many times my dad died when I was six mm -hmm. so uh you know so you know he you know can mm -hmm. can't help but think of that reality and who knows whatever you know I believe in multiple lives so I he always talks about his previous lives and, and Mars and other planets that he said he's lived on. And I, no reason to doubt him. And, you know, maybe he had, uh, you know, some tragic parental loss in a previous life or something that he can't shake. So, you know, I don't give him a hard time about it, but the truth yeah. is, you know, I kind of wanted to tell him I didn't, but me being at home with you, his name is Kai, uh, you know, like a, a brick could fall in my head and I could die at home too. So it's not really, it's, it, it's more really this destiny thing. It's, yeah. you know, our date with death, it will be when it is. And yeah. you know, we can't be afraid to live our life. Yeah. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. Yeah. And it seems like being on a highway is more dangerous than sitting in the basement, but 
Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. If it happens, it happens, you know? Yeah. What it is. So, uh, so coming to a last uh, question or two here. Mm -hmm. um, well, a few more, because uh, I do want to see if you want to share what you're up to. But um, are there any setbacks, if you feel comfortable, if not, don't worry. Are there any setbacks you feel comfortable to share in which music has helped you to pull through? I know, for example, uh, when my grandma was dying, I remember the albums I was listening to at that time and just kind of helped me to, I don't know, to kind of not get too depressed or, or help me go through that sadness in a healthy way, you know, something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want me to get deep, I'm I'm very honest, you know, and I feel like like you've said before, discussion, dialogue is very important for society. And, you know, I dealt with depression for a long, long time. I wasn't diagnosed till later on, like early adulthood, but I feel like I could say I was depressed since like fifth grade, pretty much. And I feel like that came from me not accepting myself. And I feel like music has allowed me to do that and find ways of like who I am because that's being an artist you really got to know who you are so that's what's really pushed me to like understand myself more you know otherwise I probably would have just kept being who I thought everybody wanted me to be instead of being who I want myself to be and um you know so I feel like music got me through a lot of like those depressing moments because you know music really sets the mood for whatever you're feeling and everything so if I'm feeling like I'm in a rut you know um like there's this one song that I know I'm half black as well and I'm I'm assuming a lot of people would probably know this song um called walk around heaven and it's very bittersweet for me it's um they play it a lot at funerals they played it at my grandfather's funeral when he passed and maybe my uncle's i think i know i sang at my uncle's um his eyes on a sparrow but walk around heaven is a very bittersweet song for me like it feels really good because it's like you know you're telling someone that they're gonna walk around heaven or someone's telling you they're gonna walk around heaven like that's all they want to do and stuff but it's like that means they're gone too um but yeah i mean that's the Frank Ocean in general, his album Blonde gets me through a lot of emotions. It's very nostalgic to me because it kind of brings me back to like childhood or, you know, easy like school years, you know, we had summer break, hanging out with friends and stuff and just knowing those days are gone as well. Um, but yeah, um, in general, music has helped me through a lot of my depression just with finding myself through music, just and listening to songs that are relatable, um, not just by like a particular moment, I could say, besides like my grandfather's funeral with Walk Around Heaven. Um, but other than that, yeah, I would say music just has helped me find myself and basically come out of that depression like 100%, you know, like since I've been pursuing music, it's literally been my therapy where I have not had any bouts of depression in two years, you know, wow. like after mm -hmm. consistently, like every few months going into a deep depression, like since fifth grade, you know, so I'm like, it's because I wasn't being myself. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being authentic to myself. I wasn't being genuine. You know, I was putting a lot of unnecessary pressure trying to be somebody I wasn't and would never be because it's not me, because I'm trying to listen to other people's stories about myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's so great that uh, you discovered that, you know, at an early age, you know, relatively speaking. Still getting you know, there, like, still working on it, but yeah, depression's going on. Yeah, that's, that's huge. I, I could totally get it. Uh, I don't know that, uh, I've never considered myself getting depression so i don't know if i'm in the same mm -hmm. quite the same boat but uh but no i, mean, I feel i i, I, I feel sad, sadness uh, a lot for years you know just regular sadness which is i guess kind of depression 
because it just comes like a lot yeah. often you know and uh it's family issues it's um yeah it, it's definitely dealing with me trying to be myself while trying to be this person that I think I'm supposed to be you know that conflict like you described and uh Definitely. yeah and I really think for me COVID was the, one of the greatest blessings because uh I would actually before COVID I've shared this story before um I guess on previous shows but before COVID mm -hmm. I was at this point with working with being a, a Buddhist leader with being a relatively new dad mm -hmm. um with uh family issues diabetic which you know it's a pain in the ass you got to really take care of things um yeah. all these things on t plus being a freaking artist right i actually need time to create art and then release it and then i'm an author too i can't help which is a whole nother right. layer of complication yeah. right a lot of hats you know and i'm and i'm just and i and i have this house that uh that's a, another story but i i take care of this house plus my mother's house Mm -hmm. forget about it it's so much pressure and uh I, I was getting this like heart palpitations uh mm -hmm. this is like early 2020 and I just come back from a visit to Japan and I was coming back to all my responsibilities here and I just didn't have it in me and I was starting to see some like heart doctors because I was concerned what the hell is this I didn't think it was my heart but something weird was going on yeah and uh, I had to rule it out and then COVID happened and I was about to like resign as a Buddhist leader just saying to my co-leaders that you know what I think I need a break I, I just definitely need to do less for, for a while mm -hmm. and uh, you know they understood and, um, when I released that and then I started like putting my phone in airplane mode all the time and uh, you know reducing emails as much as possible um, I started to breathe better you know feel better and uh, and they announced COVID and that uh, things, were, my job shut down. Mm. And I was just recently, a couple of months before that, thinking like, how much longer can I do this job? And I like the people I work with. I love the, the, the students I was teaching, but I could see that it was just like, I would teach, get new students. I would teach them for a while. Then students would leave and then rinse and repeat. And what was I really doing? I was able to sell my books there, which is nice. And you know, it felt very comfortable. I could work on my books and material, but financially, you know, it was just, it was the hamster wheel thing. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to do it. That my precious time, I wanted to write my freaking book. I want to put out art. I wanted to build my son and garden and, you know, yeah. take care of my health. And, and then COVID just made me stop, made everyone stop. My, and yeah. I was just like on the floor chanting and like, you know please <laughs> basically please let this last long enough for me to feel good again because i just needed the long break and and i got the longest break i could ever want and it was it was just exactly the answer to my prayer i i hope it doesn't come off the wrong way because of course i don't want i feel it yeah you know people to suffer but everybody needed a break yeah i feel like humanity was going to just yeah. gonna go off a cliff if, you know yeah. So anyway, thanks for letting me uh, speak. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, um, all right. So can you share up to three inspiring books, films, or TV shows? Any sort of inspiring things that you've taken in maybe over the past two years or just in general that people you might recommend to our listeners? Yeah. Um, so I'll recommend a book I'm reading right now, actually. This book is called The Voice of Knowledge. You probably already know it. it's a very popular book um, by Don Miguel and that's D-O-N. Mm -hmm. And so it's called it The Western Knowledge. And um, you know how I told you about the tattoo about Kismet. So the time I went to New York was last year and it was from a mentorship I did. And it was actually for a songwriting camp for Alicia Keys. And wow. it came out of nowhere. Like, well, I, I guess like, I don't want to get into like too deep because I know we have like very short time, but basically like I was doing a master class. I was trying like in my process of learning, I did I took master class and signed up for that. And I took one on song production or writing. And Alicia Keys was a teacher. And you don't actually talk to her. It's just like, you know, you watch the video and stuff. And so she had mentioned uh, or talked to a mentee of hers from her program. She is the music. 
And so I looked into She Is The Music and it was right at the same time that applications were open. So I applied and I got accepted into their songwriting mentorship. And so I was paired up with um, a woman named Chelsea Lena who wrote X for Kiana, Kiana Lede. I don't know if you know her, but she's an R&B artist. Um, and so basically out of over 300, I be, believe women in the program, my, me and another girl that were working together, we were partners. We were the only songwriting group selected to present to everybody, which was like all the important A&Rs, managers, um, CEO of Universal, UP, UMPG, you know, Universal and stuff. And, um, you know, it was crazy to like think of, like we put in a lot of work, of course, you know, but like after so many losses, I'm like, I actually got to win. Like I was, <laughs> I didn't even, that wasn't the main goal. Like I was just enjoying creating. And so they liked our project so much. They reached back out and flew us out to New York city for a songwriting camp for Alicia Keys. And that's where it goes back to my first inspiration being Alicia Keys. And I got to meet her in New York, like face to face. And mm -hmm. it was just the craziest experience of my life. But um, I actually got to meet her a second time. I was on Instagram and Alicia Keys popped up on her live. You know, she has a lot of fans. It was like a few thousand people in there. And she was doing something called like best friend day where best friend therapy, where you could like go on live with her and talk to her. And she only did four people out of those 4,000 or so that were in her live. And I was the third person that she picked <laughs> randomly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. randomly so like I got to have like a really good vibing conversation with her and that book the voice of knowledge was what she recommended to me and this mm -hmm. happened like a month ago I believe a month or two ago mm -hmm. I got the live on my Instagram and I'll share it later but you know it's like crazy destiny crazy situation so the voice of knowledge has been super influential in me right now just because like the whole idea of like story and like you know spirituality it incorporates all that and being yourself and like not letting outside influences like bring you down um the second one i'll be really quick is um it's all in your head by russ um russ is like a rapper and basically he became big just from telling himself and telling everybody he was big before he was big and so he wrote a book called it's all in your head to tell you basically how everything's all in your head um and the last one i'll say is a podcast called dissect and that's the analytical podcast. They analyze music. They basically dissect album songs, like down to the bone, to the DNA. <laughs> like they really do a deep analysis of these songs. And that's where I get a lot of my like knowledge and everything from because they do a lot of albums that I personally love. Um, they do have a few others that maybe some of the viewers might enjoy, but it's called Dissect. And I think they're on a lot of platforms. I listen to them on Spotify. Cool dissect right? mm -hmm. nice so yeah so don, the voice of knowledge don miguel ruiz mm -hmm. did you have you heard his, of his other books like the four agreements i have the four agreements i haven't read it yet but that's next that's okay next. cool yeah, yeah. That, that that that's got me through a few tight spots some of the, the main four agreements like uh don't take anything personally you know that helps that's mm -hmm. one of them um yeah, oh, cool. So great recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and that Alicia Keys story. Wow. That that's really that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine like if I I could think of my favorite singer or two. And if for some reason I get to hang out with them one day or something. Or, mm -hmm. I did have a dream that my favorite band, uh recently actually, I had a dream that my favorite band needed uh, a good one of the guitars to be replaced and they called me said you're the guy for the job and it, it, it was cool because i'm like yeah you know of course i would want to be in this band but actually uh when i woke up i'm like oh man i hope that doesn't happen because i don't actually want to go on tour and i don't want to play someone else's music and i don't want to be away from my family you know mm -hmm. so it was funny to see that uh how how much i've grown you know i matured as a person yeah but uh that you know this this kind of illusion of what i thought i would have wanted and in reality when i think about it it's, it's not what i want yeah but but i'd still like to meet them that would be cool <laughs> <laughs> for sure so if you'd like to share it you have any plans in the upcoming several months they just like to vocalize sure yeah so um actually this weekend i'll be shooting a music video throughout 
the city of Detroit for my new single, Summertime, coming out in June. And it's a real, real vibe. It's such a vibe. Um, mm -hmm. It's just very refreshing, I'll say. Nostalgic and refreshing. And then um, I'm also working on several other projects that I'm not going to specify throughout <laughs> Um, the year that will be released throughout the year too, probably by um, probably by August. That's the goal, and um, basically, yeah, the music video "Summertime" coming out in June. Um, I'm doing a show in August in New York City as well. Um, I forgot. I think it's like August. it's right before the CD Baby thing. So I'm I'm gonna be flying straight from New York City to Austin, Texas. That oh, same. Cool. <laughs> like that, that. nice yeah so that's what i got going on cool that's exciting uh you're definitely you're making your moves you know trying <laughs> yeah and whatever it is it's your like you said it's your story whatever anyone else has done the history of humanity doesn't matter because you're creating your unique misha monique story absolutely yeah and um, where can people find you to learn more about what you have to offer? Um, they can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And my handles on my Instagram and Twitter are Misha underscore Monique, um, as well as my TikTok, I believe. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I think my Facebook too. Yeah, everything's just Misha underscore Monique if you want to find me and um, I'll give you the links too. So you mm -hmm. know, any viewers that want to follow me can find those links. And, cool. and, and that's Misha with an E, right? M E. Yep. One E. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I had a friend with the I. So yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and your website, right? You have Misha Monique.com. I do. It's under construction right now because um, I'm designing it myself. I designed it like back in 19 and, um, you know, just discovering myself since then. It needs a little bit of renovation, um, but it's up there, though. It's still up if anyone wants to check it out. Cool. All right. Well, it's it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, hanging out with you, Misha. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for yeah. having me. This is actually my first interview ever Sweet. so yeah right, so this cool. is history this is a piece of history right here yeah Misha history. another part of my story yeah awesome so feel free to share it and you know if you'd like with your people going mm -hmm. forward uh this interview and looking forward to meeting you in person in austin i'm sure we'll cross yeah. paths at some point yeah we should get coffee or something while we're down there yeah definitely all right, all right misha awesome have a great night thanks again and uh, I'll uh, I'll see you in August. All right. See you then. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Have a good night.